All right, I'm Brian, CTO at Infinidat. Um, this is our first Tech Field Day. So uh, thank you for the invitation. Really, really happy to be here. Is Steven, Steve in the room? Right, hey, so Steve gave some last minute advice about how to create a good presentation. And one of those pieces of advice was not to dwell on the problem domain because it will annoy the audience. Um, so with that in mind, thank you. <laughs> With that in mind, I'd like to spend the first, let's say, 45 minutes or so talking about the question, what is big data? <laughs> I think we're, that's a nightmare. We're definitely not doing that. Um, oh, good. You had about 30 seconds. <laughs> right. <laughs> I saw the hook starting to emerge from the corner. So of what I'd like to do instead is to have a, a deep, genuine discussion about how the technology works, how we do what we do, but also have a cool discussion about not just the hows, but also some whys, about why we do certain things certain ways. Why is it hybrid instead of all flash? Why do we do our file system the way we do, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the first, I'd actually like to start with a why question, which is why do this at all? Why? Money, why else? <laughs> why? No, it's for the fulfillment. Why another storage company? There's other things we could do. We could, we could create another food delivery app. We could create Uber for pets. <laughs> we could create another ad tech platform that spies on users, and we could sell the information to, to marketers. Um, oops. This is why. Um, so you guys probably know, uh, at the beginning of the last decade, we sequenced the first complete human genome. It was called the Human Genome Project. It's a, it was a pretty big deal. And that first genome, that first two billion odd base pairs, cost $100 million to sequence. And since then, the cost has dropped by five orders of magnitude. So forget about Moore's Law and Kreider's Law and all the things that we're proud of as technologists. The biologists are kicking our ass. And this is actually a very serious problem. We are at the point now where the TCO of a sequenced human genome is dominated by the cost of storing the bits and bytes all the way at the end of the pipeline. Genomics has become a data storage problem. And why do we care? So there are conversations going on right now between genomics companies and nation states to sequence the genome of every citizen. And this will become the first record in the child's electronic medical health record. And it'll form the basis of what's called personalized medicine. This is- you mentioned how much easier it makes Big Brother to keep track of every place mm. you've been. There's, there are staggering privacy implications to it about data stewardship and ownership. And there's a lot of thought leadership, uh, especially coming out of the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT, who I consider to be thought leaders on the privacy issues, along with tech, the, tech, the technology. But I'm an optimist, so I believe that we're gonna figure this out. <clears throat> um, this is going to fundamentally transform medicine like we have never seen in our lifetime. This is gonna be up there with the germ theory of disease and the polio vaccine. It's within reach, it's happening right now, but we have a huge data storage problem. We are talking about hundreds of exabytes of data at scale. It is safety and life critical data. A bit flip in this case is the digital equivalent of a mutation. It's misidentification of a tumor. It's giving the wrong medicine to, uh, to a patient. It has to be cheap enough that not only first world countries, <clears throat> but emerging economies too can afford to do this for their citizens. And this data has to be stored and organized in such a way that it's easy to compute on. We can't do this with tape. It has to be super high performance. It has to be online. There is no technology that exists that makes this possible yet. The reason why I told this story is that a couple of years ago, a computational biologist explained this 
to my boss. He told him that the biggest problem that he has in his lab has nothing to do with biology. It's what to do with these petabytes of data that are coming out of the sequencing machines, how to analyze them, how to store them. The scientific mission was being held back by IT. <clears throat> and anyway, contemplation of this question brought together a group of storage engineers who developed a kernel of an idea, a software architecture that can solve this. And I'm here to give you an update on where we're at. Five years later, a couple of million lines of C++, Python, and Java, over a person's century of software development time, and $230 million worth of capital later. Um, and by the way, this isn't just for genomics. It's the same problems for the industrial internet of things, for cybersecurity, for exabyte scale cloud computing. <clears throat> As you will see, it is a beautiful software architecture. I am certain that this is the finest storage system that has ever been created. And it is the most credible solution I have seen for solving these types of problems at scale. The first problem that we have to solve technically is we have to take very large address spaces and we need to partition them down into smaller units that are easy to compute on. And in our taxonomy, we call this address space that's visible to users the VUA, or Virtual User Address Space. And it's a thinly provisioned virtual space um, and the way to think of it is if you take an InfiniBox system and you define a one petabyte volume, you have a one petabyte VUA. If you take a snap of that volume, you have a two petabyte VUA, the original volume and the snap. If you take 100 snaps, you have a 102 petabyte VUA. Now, the next step is we have to take this address space and we have to shard it out into smaller units for computing on. We have to take something infinite and make it finite. And so we do this in our architecture with uh, an object that we call a virtual unit. So a VU is an application container that manages a portion of the address space that's visible to users. And the way that we construct volumes is we just do a simple stripe across the VUs. <clears throat> so this allows us to have a trivial, very simple mapping between any address that's visible to users and VU ownership. We just do a modulo operation. So you take the LBA that you're interested in in 64 kilobyte section. 64 kilobytes is a magic number that's going to come up a lot in this discussion in the next hour and just do modulo number of VUs, you get a VU number, and that's who owns that portion of the address space. <clears throat> so along with partitioning the space out and taking something infinite and making it finite for computation, the virtual units are also our first level of abstraction away from physical hardware. And as such, they form the basis of our resiliency scheme to survive physical node failure of our hardware. So let me give you an example graphically. Imagine a hypothetical InfiniBox that has three physical servers that are hosting, which by the way is coincidentally exactly what we support in production today, hosting six virtual units. So you can see that each server is primary for, uh, for two out of those six VUs. Now let's add a tiny little bit of, uh, of complexity. Along with primary ownership, which is indicated by the solid lines, we're going to make each of those servers also secondary for another six VUs, or excuse me, for another two VUs. And secondary ownership of a VU means that there is no active date of processing for that VU on that node. But what we're doing is we're accepting a mirror 
of all incoming writes <coughs> and also mirroring certain metadata which allows us to immediately restart the VU and continue processing on that alternate node in the event of a primary failure and not have any uh, loss to the dirty write cache and, uh, or downtime or anything like that. So let me just show you a simple animation. This is normal operation. <clears throat> and uh, if you can see, we lose a uh, server that has physically failed. So now there's three VUs that are primary on A, three VUs that are primary on C, and they're mirroring to each other, right mirroring for data protection. And then usually the next question is, well, what happens if two server fails? <clears throat> now you can see that all of the VUs in the event of node A failing along with node B, all of the VUs will be active on, uh, on one server. So given what I've said, why is this bad? Why is this dangerous? <clears throat> Think about write cache. It's a, it's a write back model. You lose the write data in server A and server B when they go down. <clears throat> so we're, from the, the first two state changes, we're fine because we're mirroring to somebody else. From this point forward, if this server C fails, we're going to lose writes that are in flight and we're going to have data corruption. So we would never allow a system to run in production like this. So does that mean you fall back to write through or, you, or when two controllers fail, you go offline? So that's a very good question. So it's actually a system variable. It's a setting of what we want the system to do like this. And the default is that if we have two servers, the system will stop accepting writes. Node failures are exceedingly rare. They're so rare that I get a page if a customer node actually fails. Um, and we how have, many of those yeah, pages do you gotten? get? <laughs> and, and what percentage of them are stupid power failures leading into the nodes? So I, it, power, that's an excellent question. We have done a tremendous amount of work to make server failures as rare as possible. They require a person coming out on site. And even if you develop a perfect scheme like this, it's still a it's still a, an event that's going to get everybody's attention and wake everybody up in engineering. So I'm going to explain some design patterns, both in the power architecture, physically with hardware, two slides down, and also some software design patterns around uh, putting code in the kernel versus in user space that all comes together and makes node failures a very, very rare process. I would say I, we get a couple a year at this point with the, um, with the level of, of, uh, of deployments that we have. However, th that's not a complete answer. Nodes fail every week, if not every day, they, they fail every week during POCs because this is something that customers oh, yeah. beat to death during evaluation. They want to That's what we have thermite for. <laughs> <laughs> right. So as I, in summary, this is bad. Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> so let, another question? So, under normal conditions, you've got, we've got a primary, and it is maintaining cache coherency with a secondary, similarly to an active passive. Cache coherency makes it sound uh, more sophisticated than it is. Let's say I'm VU zero, and I own a certain ad address range. Right. I'm running under normal operation on node one. Mm -hmm. My standby location is node three. So if the physical server that I'm on right. is crashing, I'm going to restart in however many milliseconds on node three. In order to make it so that I'm able to do that, any writes that come into me, I'm going to mirror over our InfiniBand network, and I'm going to keep in cache over there. And we're not going to acknowledge the write back to the host until we have it in memory in both the primary and secondary location. So I guess it is cache coherency, but it's, it's a it relatively... It's write cache coherency. You're not worrying about the, the, the secondary isn't keeping the read cache coherent, and so you don't have to worry, isn't keeping the read cache, yes. and so you don't have to worry about cache pollution problems. That's precisely how it works, yes. Okay. All right. Uh, so, gents, I'd like to take a uh, short break from the data path and discuss the, the physical hardware that the system runs on. And I think that'll complete the picture and kind of make the rest of the discussion uh, as, as awesome as possible. I'm going to start at the top of the rack. This is super washed out. 
<laughs> but uh, I'll, do, I'll do the best I can. Here in Darth Vader Black, yeah. we have... At the top of the rack, we have a triple redundant power and data path. Um, this is just a summary slide. I have details on each of these. So um, what I mean by triple redundant is that we are N plus two redundant on hardware for every component in the system. So one of our fundamental design policies is we need to be able to s s uh, survive two simultaneous failures of any given component and not um, have interruption of access to the data or, or, uh, or data loss. And the key, the kind of star of the show here is we have three what we call nodes. They're big beefy Linux servers. They're clustered together with a point-to-point -point InfiniBand mesh. I have enough diagrams to... Yeah, it's a thick deck you gave us, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> these, three uh, these three nodes, number one, they host the front end, what we call the port drivers. So all host connectivity comes through these three nodes. And you can see on the index here, we have 24 8 gig fiber channel ports, either six or 12 customer configurable 10 gigabit ethernet ports. And we accept all of our host IO from there. The three nodes also host the caching layer of our architecture. Every system has up to 3.2 terabytes of DRAM and up to 48 terabytes of NAND flash. The DRAM and the flash act as a transparent cache that sits in front of the disk drives and keeps the working set of data in memory. And I have plenty of content about precisely how all that stuff works. But suffice to say now, this is okay, a... But that, but that read cache isn't kept coherently, so... No. So a node failure is going to give me a, short, a, a temporary performance loss as that yes. reheats. Yes. OK. And then finally. And, and by active, 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 you're, you mean a Lua-like, right? Um, what we mean is that you do an IO to any port on any node, and it's treated exactly the same. There's no notion of trespassing or LUN affinity. OK, but, but you said There's there no was passive a passive node in the system. No. But you said there was a primary that the writes went to? Is that a different <clears throat> object than these nodes? So the nodes are just physical hosts that are running the VU containers. Oh, OK. So the, those, those nodes are logical, not physical. Precisely, yes. I, I apologize if that wasn't clear. The, uh, the VUs are application containers. And then okay. we have a clustering mechanism. But the, ap but the application container that's primary for any given l address sp area, yes. Any given address space, which is likely to be a LUN or a file, it'll um, it'll, it'll be a portion of. Yeah. A LUN. So the question oh, okay. is: Do you do okay. you have to forward a, a write operation to a different server if it doesn't happen to two be thirds this of, VU? Two thirds, thirds of the time. Two thirds of the time, because we just what we ask for from hosts is just give us round robin. Right. It's you know, it it it's a Lua like, but way at the sub LUN level. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then finally, at the end of the, what we, the, we you call the back end of the architecture, starting kind of where the X and InfiniBox is down to the bottom, we have eight disk enclosures. Each enclosure has 60 top-loading nearline SAS drives for a total of 480 spinning HDDs in the big system. So let's actually talk about some details. I think several of you have already seen that previous slide in briefings. Um, so this is a diagram of our power architecture. So you can see that we have two incoming um, power ingress from two power buses in the data center. A couple of things to note. First, the disk enclosures are not protected by our own internal UPS. They are connected directly to data center power. So what this means is that in our system, if there is an emergency power off in the data center, the disk drives immediately disappear. So um, in the event of a full emergency power off in the data center, the nodes will vault to uh, local disk, which is where they would keep the, um, the, the, the dirty write cache right vaulted cache, yeah. for the future. <clears throat> so starting at the servers, each server has a pair of power supplies, which are cross-connected to two out of three UPS modules. These are small 1U battery backup units, we call them, or UPSs. Their job is to keep the servers up and running in the event of an emergency power off in the data center 
to give us enough time to destage the right cache, to vault it, and to orderly shut down the machine. Okay, you, you said disk a second ago, you meant flash for the destage, right? Yes. Okay. It's flash. Yeah, so you need a minute and a half, two minutes. Uh, I guess it depends on the size of the of the Cash. of the of the of the, of the pending writes, but it's it's something something but on two, the order of that. Two minutes to flash is oh yeah yeah it's a not a cache right right now above each of the UPSs is an automatic transfer switch. An ATS is a double pole excuse me a double throw triple pole latching relay, and this component's job is to keep the UPS downstream of it energized as long as one of the two incoming power buses are energized. So in other words, the ATS protects against one of the power um, ingresses failing, and then the UPSs protect your write cache in the event of a full EPO. And UPSs are battery? Yeah, they're, these are Eaton. I mean, our, our f favored supplier is Eaton. Yeah. UPS yeah. modules. And, and, um, and I would imagine that they're way over spec <laughs> Yeah, so... You probably need like 500 watts and so you've probably got like 1,500 KVA UPSs. Yeah, so it's funny... Um, Just because that's the smallest one they make that rack mounts. <laughs> this is not a super sexy thing. I mean, we can't put do marketing around this, yeah. but in our experience, you have to get this right. When power anomalies occur on storage systems, that's when catastrophic system failure occurs. Um, and by the way, I'm not going to name any naughty name, any other vendors in this discussion, but, but I'll tell you but right now. But it's three letters and starts with a vowel. <laughs> there are, uh, there is a um, toast of the town storage product right now where the diagram in the um, this diagram in the sales materials does not match what happens if you open up and you trace the cables <laughs> they are hiding <laughs> single points of failure that happen somewhere here this, um, this is why I have people ship working gear to the lab yeah this stuff isn't sexy but if you get this wrong um, it's when bad things happen and also we have so many tricks that we've learned you know, Randy talked about over time with each iteration, you stand on the shoulders of the giants before you. We have so many interesting little things we do. The UPSs communicate how much um, charge they have yeah. to the nodes. And we dynamically size the, uh, the write cache based on the amount of backup to ensure that we're never in a case where there's more write cache than the batteries uh, can Such. destage. How did we learn this? Again, through 30 years of storage operations. Power goes out in the data center. They think they have it back up. The electricians say, okay, power up the storage arrays. They power it up. In rush, and then trips the breaker and the power fails again. Less than 15 minutes later before the batteries are fully charged, there's a short and now you're in a position. So the guys, we've seen all of this before. And, so, and just to clarify, we only protect the cache, obviously, with yes. the BBUs. Right. Yeah. Disk drives, as soon as the power goes off, on their own. they disappear. Yeah. Been, been there, done that. This is a simple diagram of our favored uh, vendor for uh, disk enclosures. It's a Noisys Samina ND4600. Um, by the way, I just want to say, some of you might know Azar Sharon, who's our beloved president of the company and he runs our business here in the US. Upon reviewing these materials, Azar, who's a man of few words, said, don't call it exploded. <laughs> <laughs> so, Which is a fair point. Thank you for, thank you for, it's, a, it's an engineering technical term. Um, <laughs> what you can see is we have 60 top loading yes, drives. Yes, but you have served, served um, in the IDF. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, believe me, I'm well aware that if there's certain things that if I talk about, there'll be a drone strike. That comes <laughs> gets me at the Holiday Inn. Yeah. Um, so there are a pair of uh, <coughs> um, power supplies, which have the blowers. The, the unit can run on one. We have two. And then there are two I.O. modules. The I.O. module is basically a SAS expander. It has SAS cables coming in, which I will show you on the next diagram. And then it has a spider cable coming out with 60 um, cables that goes to the 60 drives. You can access any drive through any one of the ports redundantly in the back. Obviously, they're dual-ported drives. 
<clears throat> so this is a diagram of the way that we actually cable up the array. So let me step you through the design. We take the eight disk enclosures and we daisy chain them together into four sets of two each. We then run a SAS cable physically from each couple up to each of the three servers. And then in black, we have an InfiniBand point-to-point -point connection. There's, there's no IB switching. It's a point-to-point -point connection between the three servers. So fundamental to our architecture is that every node can access every disk. There's, it's not like typical scale-out designs where this server controls these ones and he manages these. Everybody can see everything. Now, during normal operation... I'm having a little trouble with that given the nature of SAS. Because each enclosure's got two I.O. modules. Mm -hmm. Each drive's connected to both I.O. modules. Yes. But three doesn't go into two. <laughs> yeah, so technically I misled you when I said we're N plus two redundant from top to bottom. The one place where it becomes only two is finally at the port of each individual drive. Is that the where you were going? No, it's, it? the, it's the step before that. So <clears throat> if you go, draw two enclosures and three servers on the whiteboard. Two enclosures and three servers. And so we'll, we'll leave out the power supply. So this is IO1. This is IO2. There's four ports on each. Right. Oh, you don't have SAS expanders, you have SAS switches. So, so it's very straightforward, so let me show yeah, you. Yeah, no, no, I, I just got it. So first we daisy chain, like this. Right. So now we have a, um, we've unified these two SAS fabrics, if you want to call it that. And then we would go, for example, node one, node two, Node three, right? But you can you can dynamically change the I/O module port to oh, yeah, drive yeah, yeah. port. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And and yeah. we have another uh, we have yeah. another trick. Dumb in there. expanders can't do that. They're just a fan out. We have another trick in here. Okay. So under normal operation, let's say uh, node A wants to write to this disk drive, it's going to go over the direct connection to that couplet. In the case, in the event that that direct link is either disabled, congested, or whatever, this node will go over InfiniBand to either B or C, who will then issue its SCSI request by proxy um, on behalf of server A. So this was a pain in the ass to code. We basically had to... Just tracking the load level on all the SAS connections in the payment. Well, that's why there's yeah. currently 46 granted patents on this architecture <laughs> right, and another 60 right. in the pipeline. So. Right. so what we had to do is we had to take SCSI and we had to make it so that we could do it by proxy over InfiniBand and then we needed to have priority levels and monitoring and all this stuff. But the result is it allows us to only have one cable going to each system. It radically reduces the number of cables. And again, thinking about serviceability, the complexity of these systems in the field, the more complex it is, the more likely that um, a technician who may be fatigued, <coughs> they may be getting bad information or be on a bad connection on their phone, is going to pull the wrong cable or get confused. So that very simple trick of doing SCSI requests for backup, um, backup paths over InfiniBand saves us a lot so of complexity. So the connection between server C and that are what? So, yeah, yeah. So I'm still trying to figure out what you is. It a SAS switch in each of the the disk in each shelves? of the I/O modules. I'm sorry, it's in the I/O modules. A SAS switch. Yeah. So yeah, the green, the red, and the orange, I guess, is six gig SAS, and then the black is InfiniBand. It's 56 yeah, no, gigabit. I understand the black. I understand the SCSI by proxy. I'm just trying to figure out so. The server C is directly connected to all of the drive shelves. Again? It's not. Say again? Server C, is, is it directly connected to all the drive shelves? Yes. 
Well, ex excuse me, it's directly connected to each of the four couplings. Notice that there's four. Uh, yeah, it's only connected on this chart, it's only connected to one drive shelf. So this one goes to this one here, this one goes to this, this one goes to this, this one goes oh, to this. Go through. They're well, since they're daisy chained, oh, okay. these are a single, the these are a pair the of. Count too. Right. So those orange lines physically connect it to those boxes underneath it? Yeah. They are physical cables, yes. Guys, redo that slide instead of green, red, and orange to green, red, and blue, because the red and orange, are, you can't tell. Right. Yeah. So, by the way, guys, I didn't, I didn't say this you're in the beginning. You're an engineer, but you're not, that we understand. This is basically the training class that we give to new software developers when they're hired. This is the first time that we've ever... So, you're saying by the time we're done with here, we'd be software developers? <laughs> if anybody is interested and in, we're accepting... Got it. We're accepting... Okay, if you guys, yeah, What's hold. the entry-level salary now? <laughs> <laughs> it's a free helicopter ride to start. Yeah. Free heli everybody gets a free helicopter right. ride on their birthday. Don't, don't be nervous if he hands you a parachute. So anyway, <laughs> do, you guys, do you guys grok the, the cabling and the, and, the, and the hardware design? Because there's more, there's more cool stuff. So anyway... Let, let's recap of kind of what we've discussed so far in the design. So we have a cluster of three off-the-shelf Linux servers. By the way, our preferred vendor, Dell R730s. There's absolutely nothing exotic about our hardware, anything. <clears throat> um, we've configured the power, um, the power path to be maximally resilient, resilient against various um, failure scenarios. And across that cluster, we have 24 8 gig fiber channel ports and either 6 or 12 10 gig E's. And we also have a ton of CPU cores, DRAM, and flash, which we're going to use later. Below that in the rack, we have 480 spinning hard drives in eight disk enclosures. And we've also constructed what's essentially a very simple volume manager that breaks data up into 64 kilobyte sections and routes that over InfiniBand to a VU who owns that based on a, um, a very simple sharding mechanism that just takes the offset and does a modulo operation. And then finally, we've created a basic resiliency scheme for the containers so that they can fail over in the event of a physical um, node loss. So we are well on the way of describing a complete storage system. What we need to do next in our time here is we need to build out a virtualization layer, a RAID engine, and a cache manager. Any questions on this stuff before we keep going? Uh, ju just on the disk, so you, you are using uh, SATA drives in the backend? Uh, yeah, so we use uh, nearline SAS okay. drives. We support three, four, and six terabyte drives in production. And in today. the future, uh, do you... So right now we're testing uh, engineering samples for 8 and 10 terabytes, but we've specifically designed this product around the roadmap from ASTC going out for the next decade. Um, I mean, we're going to have 25 terabyte, 3.5 inch drives in, in the not too distant future. And yeah. um, you, you'll, you'll see once we talk about our data path and how we lay the data out, we've specifically designed it to be able to use extremely large disk drives without compromising. extremely low also because probably you will have uh, SMR drives at the... Uh, right. Yeah, point. so um, when SMR is very interesting. We do a log structured write, so we write from the outer rim to the inner rim regardless of what the incoming I.O. pattern is. So we're ready for SMR and we it's a perfectly designed uh, data model for using SMR drives, but we don't use them yet. We don't need to. The pricing that we're getting on standard um, drives are good enough right now that we don't need to. Um, the big, the game changer that's coming up is Hammer and then BPR after that. And if you guys are interested in uh, futures for disk drives, we can, I have some... Oh, disk drives with freaking lasers, it can't, doesn't get better than that. Yeah. yeah, really fast lasers too. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if you guys know what surface plasmons are. I'm just going to nerd out for a second. Uh, <laughs> so the, one of the fundamental problems that they have with Hammer is that, if you guys probably all remember from physics class, is that you can't focus with a, with a lens using classical optics. You can't focus a laser to be less than, I think half it's wavelength. half the wavelength. wavelength yeah. um, so these geniuses 
uh, working at Seagate and HGST, are basically exploiting a technology that's very old. It's what gives, when you look at stained glass, which gives it the, the color, which is called surface plasmons, where you shine a laser into a special type of crystal and it then re-emits a photons at a much, much smaller wavelength, which allows them to focus the laser and have a grain size, which is a fraction of the wavelength of the laser. It's absolutely amazing physics. Um, and if we have time, I'd, I'd love to talk a little bit about we our- have a cool GIF that shows one of the right heads. That's right, we do have a GIF about that that we got from, uh, from Seagate. Yeah. <clears throat> We have more work to do in the software architecture before we can talk about media yet. So what I'd like to do is to, um, to kind of travel into a, into a VU. And I apologize, that's very, um, that's very cosmos. <laughs> imagine Never you're, apologize imagine you're cosmos a photon like. traveling at the speed of light <laughs> through optical fibers into an Infinibox VU. See, um, was, I thought it was more the movie trailer. In a world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let's go into and look at a VU uh, and talk about virtualization. Now, for the rest of this, you know, the next like five or six slides, keep in the back of your head that we're only looking at one shard of the address space, and this is actually happening in parallel on all of the VUs. But uh, we're just going to imagine what's going on in one. And it's the volume manager, of course, that constructs this together. So you guys remember that we give a name to the address space that's visible to users. We call it the VUA. So let's now introduce the first level of virtualization in our data path, which is a mapping between the virtual user space that's visible to users and an internal address space that we call the VDA, or virtual disk address space. Now, just like the VUA is virtual and infinite, the VDA is thickly provisioned and it is highly finite because it's the physical space that's available for storing data. It is precisely defined as the raw storage capacity, the sum of the capacity of the disk drives, minus the RAID overhead, which in our design is two blocks of parity or two sections of parity for every 14 sections of data, minus 5% overhead for rebuilds. So like modern storage systems, we do not have spare drives. There's no hot spares or anything like that. We have reserve capacity in each of the drives which are used uh, to rebuild in the event of a, of a disk drive failure. And we have enough capacity, we guarantee the survival of 12 disk drives, and the system, even if the system's completely full of data, it will continue to run. So, okay. the, uh, is there a question? No, just remind me what the N for N plus two was? Uh, just N as... Uh, you, how many data, you said you, were, you had N well, data strips and two parity strips? Oh, uh, 14 data sections. 14 plus two. Four, 14 plus two, yes. Thank you. Sure. So, so just, just to clarify, so sure. did you say that you can guarantee to lose 12 drives and everything across continues to function? Across the whole system, even if the system is 100% written. And that's any 12 drives or any 12 specific drives. 12 drives? Any 12 drives. Well, not simultaneously. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. The way that, because it's uh, two... How it's much space they have available for rebuild. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because it's a double parity... This is a great time for a Java update. <laughs> <laughs> is there any good time for Thank Java? You, <laughs> it's always time for Java. Right. <laughs> so because, uh, anyway, so the, the, I'm going to now share with you what, what I consider to be the first real breakthrough that, that makes Infinibox possible. Um, and it is the way that we actually do mapping between these two. We store the mapping between the, the virtual space that's visible to users and the physical space for storing data in a tri data structure. So it's said that behind every great product is a great data structure. For us, it is a tri. Despite what Yoda says, there are many tries <laughs> in, uh, in the Infinibox world. Okay, for a poor old chemistry major, 
What's a tri? Ah, <clears throat> a tri is an ordered tree data structure, but it has a couple of fascinating little properties that make it exceedingly good uh, for storage virtualization. Now, this is the point at which I have to get the taser ready, and I'll have Moshe on the uh, on the earpiece. <laughs> yes, I was warned not to not, not to get too technical, but this is so freaking cool, and also it, it's what makes virtualization at this scale possible. What's special about a tri as opposed to other types of trees for storing data is that the nodes themselves do not store the keys, but rather it's the specific traversal from null down to the key that has encoded in it the key, which for us is a pointer to the location. So it's not the destination, it's the journey? It's the journey, yes. <laughs> so tries are inherently compact. They also have other properties. Um, they have locality of reference built into them. So they uh, compute exceedingly well and cache exceedingly well on modern CPUs with out of order execution. But there's also something about our implementation which makes it super space efficient as well. Each entry in the try is a pointer from an address space visible to users and a physical location on disk. Notice in this example that the sixth um, rectangle is much bigger than all the others, but it's a single pointer to a location on disk. Tries allow us to have an infinitely variable block size or um, section size between this mapping. And what this means is that when you write a single file to our file system, regardless of its size, it's exactly one entry in the try that we have to create. Um, similarly, if you are writing to a block volume and you write a huge backup job, like a huge sequential or whatever, yeah. in principle, regardless of how big it is, it's only a single entry that we have to make. So we exploit sequentialness to keep the try compact. So space compactness is good because it allows us to save memory, it keeps the data structures small, but what really matters and the real game changer for us is the performance. Tries are unicorn data structures. They are O of one for both inserts and searches. And think about a virtualized storage system. A search is a read give me this data at this address. Where is it located? That's a search in the try to find where, where the data is. An insert is a write. Here is a piece of data. Go store it somewhere. That mapping between the, the address that it was written to and where we actually store it is, is a write. So stuff like this as technologists, we usually think about as undergraduates Maybe if you're doing a coding interview, they'll make you do a try and, you know, and whatever, and then you never think about them. But the performance of core data structures, when you're thinking about exabyte scale computing, the performance of core data structures is critically important. And the key takeaway with this is from the first block of data that's written into this up to the theoretical limit, which is two to the 64, files for us in the file system, and it's effectively infinite within provisioning for the block. The performance, the lookup time of the Same. core data structure is absolutely flat. Um, a couple of other things that are just uh, interesting to, to, to grok this. Notice that there are examples here where there are two LBAs that are visible to hosts that point to the same physical location. Single instance storage? Single instance storage. Snapshots. When you create a snapshot, you're gonna have other LBA addresses that are pointing to the same thing. Also looking forward in our roadmap to VVOL, which is not ready yet, but we're, we're working on it. Yeah, you and everybody else. To dedupe <laughs> and, uh, and other data reduction technologies. We designed this around the requirements for this and the idea that you have to be able to very easily, with metadata only, be able to uh, virtualize. So are, are you single instancing now or is this duplicate? Uh, we, 
No, no, no. We single instance in cache, but uh, if you write lots of different, if you write the same data in a lot of places, we will store lots of copies of it on disk. Okay, so, that, so this is all duplicate avoidance in, in creating clones and the like. Uh, uh, no, no, no. So that is all virtualized. But I'm saying that if you, what I'm saying is we don't have deduplication. Yeah, no, I, yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I got it. Okay, got it. That's no, no, the, the, there's confusion about deduplication and how it relates to things like clones. And I just, I use the term duplicate avoidance because by creating a clone, I just did the metadata and I didn't create the duplicates in the first place. Yes, and we do, that's exactly what we do. Yeah, you're being much more generous about the definitions than, uh, than uh. <laughs> All right, so again. I, I have to because I have to make stupid vendors happy. Yes, I'm familiar with stupid vendors. Just to, uh, <laughs> recap, to recap the data path so far, you do an I.O. to any, any port on any node, it hits what, uh, a component that we call our port drivers. So you'll see we have port drivers for Fiber Channel, for iSCSI, for NFS. That's what we support in production today. Fi FICON and Swift and others and SMB are coming in the future. The port driver breaks it up into 64 kilobyte objects. We disperse it to the uh, VU that owns that particular object, the simple modulo function based on the address, and we're good to go. What's the 4K? Ah, so for each 64 kilobyte data section, CRC, we have a 4 kilobyte metadata area. And the 4K metadata area includes a checksum, which we write to disk alongside the data. If you are not doing this on a storage system, you are guaranteed to have data corruption. If you look at the bit error rates on large nearline SAS drives, on the EMLC drives, you are guaranteed to have data corruption. We also store a set of metadata that we use for IO classification that helps us with cache management and prefetching, which I have a, uh, a couple of slides on. And it's, it's another set of uh, intellectual property we have that's, that's really, really cool. But suffice to say, right now, we break the data up at the port driver level and we disperse it. Another thing I'd like to point out just at this point, um, these port drivers all run in user space. So even the uh, fiber channel drivers and things, they think they're running in the kernel, but they're actually running in a container in user space. And the reason we do this is drivers tend to be the most unstable part of code in a storage system. They're all the way at the edge of the system. They're exposed to what users are doing. And the classic scenario is, you know, an HBA initiator goes crazy. It starts sending weird malformed packets. And it hits the port driver on a storage system. And then the engine fails, or the controller, whatever the vendor calls it. And then that cluster failover mechanism has to happen. So of course we support that. That was the VU failover and the write mirroring we talked about. But in order to get to mainframe class reliability, you have to have defense in depth. You can't rely on one thing to protect you. <clears throat> so even though we are tolerant against a physical node failure, we want to make them as rare as possible. And one of our mantras is to keep the smallest amount of humanly possible code in the kernels. Because when the kernel, when driver code that's running in kernel space misbehaves, the operating system will stop and you now have to do a failover. And um, Brian's going to get a page and, you know, it always seems to happen at night. So that's one example. Another thing that I don't have diagrammed here, but just be aware, all of our endpoints are completely virtual. So they're virtual IP addresses, they're IQNs that move around. But also, the fiber channel WWNs themselves are virtualized. They're not tied to any port. So in the event of, let's say, a, um, a GBIC failure or, a, or, 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 or whatever, long before the multipath driver detects that is down and SCSI timeout and all that stuff, we are going to detect that. We will restart that WWN on, another, on one of the other 23 fiber channel ports that are, zone, that are connected into the same fabric. It requires no intervention on behalf of the users because the WWN that they put in their zone sets is virtualized. This is NPIV in reverse. 
It's exactly what is done for virtual machines and to allow data mobility, but we're doing it for target ports. Um, again, I don't know why everybody doesn't do this, but it's, uh, it's again, it's part of that philosophy of defense in depth. So if the driver's in a container, can you restart the driver if it fails? Yes. Without, so we have a, without taking the server down. Oh, right. yeah. So it's a watchdog process that just looks and makes sure it's up. If it's down, it's a process that just died. It gets restarted, and that's it. <clears throat> so continuing the uh, actual data path discussion. Right now, what, what we've kind of built out is we have this system for collecting data and kind of just putting it into the cache. So now we need to eventually start bringing media and destaged and everything into this process. So running on each of the VUs is a process called an allocator thread. The job of the allocator is to pick data sections out of cache and to group them into structures that we call D-stage stripes. And each D-stage stripe has 14 data sections. It's, and each of those sections is 64K of data and 4K of metadata. So with that in mind, if we go back to that VDA, that linear space that's the first level of virtualization down, you can think of it as just the concatenation of all of the stripes. <clears throat> And the try, of course, is the, um, the, the data structure that holds that mapping between the two. So let me give you a little bit more detail about what that, um, how that uh, D-stage stripe and all that works. Along with picking 14 data sections out of memory, the allocator thread also computes parity. And we use a very simple parity mechanism. It is computed only with XORs. It runs on the general purpose CPUs. There's no special hardware or anything like that. Um, there is no Reed Solomon coding. In fact, our algorithm provably uses half the number of CPU cycles of any Reed Solomon family code. So we take the, the message. We compute horizontal and diagonal parity, which becomes what we call P1 and P2. So on disk, with protection, a stripe is actually 16. It's 14 data sections and two parity sections. Each of them is 64K of data plus four, it's 68K. So the total is each stripe is 1.088 megabytes. Would a stripe like that come from multiple servers or only from one server's? Uh, <coughs> multiple servers. So multiple it would servers. Come from multiple servers. Yeah, it's a, that's an excellent question, and I actually have two slides down to talk about how we. Perfect. Because I glossed over it, I said it just chooses. There's actually a lot of computation that goes into the into the choosing. <coughs> but to keep it simple, just to keep the dis the discussion going. After the allocator computes parity and we have an array of 16 sections. The final thing it does is it assigns the stripe to a RAID group. RAID groups are invisible. Customers cannot see them or users cannot see them. And they are quite simply a bucket that stores stripes. So think of this as a RAID group here. <clears throat> it supports, it has a width of 16 sections. And then it has a depth, which is uh, based on whatever the size of the drives are. Each of the columns, each of the 16 columns we call a, uh, a member or a column. Each of these members or each of these columns lives on exactly one partition of exactly one hard drive on the back end of the system. To put it another way, each of these rectangles is one of the eight disk enclosures. Each of these cylinders is one of the 60 disk drives in the enclosure. On each disk drive is a number of partitions. Well, it's 246, if you're curious. Each of these DPs or partitions corresponds to exactly one column on a RAID group somewhere. Okay. What this and does, sorry, question? The, the depth of that RAID group is 256 stripes? Partitions. 
Uh, no, the number of partitions on a physical disk drive yeah. is 246, I believe. I mean, it's an implementation detail and a system variable. So here's the way to think about it, very simply. If you pull a disk drive out of an InfiniBox, right. that disk drive will have 246 columns of 246 different RAID groups. It has 1 16th of a RAID group times however many partitions okay. are on the drive. Fine, I was just, for a second I wasn't tracking how you could still do a many to many, but I right. got it. So, what we've done with this is we have created a very simple system that allows us to interleave lots of data from lots of different RAID groups onto an overlay it or map it to a finite number of disk drives. And this is the secret to being able to do very fast rebuilds and have even performance regardless of what the, the I.O. pattern is. One thing I will point out is we use what we call a minimum contention algorithm for um, assigning columns to uh, partitions. It's static. It only changes when the topology of the array changes, when disk drives are added or removed. And the way the algorithm works is it does two things. Number one, it tries to keep the, the columns of a given RAID group as far away from each other on the back end as possible. So certainly on the not, not on the same disk drive. You don't want them bunching up on one disk enclosure. So you want two columns on each of the eight disk enclosures. But the algorithm also works to minimize the number of any two RAID groups that have common members on a disk drive. And the reason we do this is those unions are in the event of a triple disk failure are where the data loss will occur. So by keeping that as small as possible, it allows us to exit and get from n plus 2 to n plus 1 redundancy very, very quickly in the event of a single disk failure. And exiting that phase is critical for being able to have long-term resiliency. So that's it. From a data path perspective, you now know exactly how data starts at a logical volume or a LUN, <clears throat> how we map that through the VDA or the VUA to VDS mapping, which we store in the TRI, which is our layer of virtualization for thin provisioning for snapshots. And then the second level of abstraction, which is the mapping between the linear VDS space and the individual disk drives. And that's all there is to the data path. <clears throat> the next thing that I'd like to share with you guys is to talk a little bit about randomness. Because it is one of the more enduring sources of bullshit in the storage industry. <laughs> Your data is not sequential. It is random. Um, and it actually turns out that that is very almost never the case. Um, there is a spectrum of, of potential correlation of IOs ranging from completely uncorrelated, which would be a random number generator spraying random data across the entire address space. Or iometer. Which is where you see that. To real world applications where readers and writers are organized in the compute space into threads and processes. There are parts of applications that have internal data structures. <clears throat> And ultimately, at the end of the pipe, there are either users that are clicking on things and following a stream of consciousness, or sensors that are measuring physical phenomena and streaming that down. The, it's true that an individual I.O. request has very little context. It has a file system ID or a volume ID. It has an offset and a byte range. But my, what, my postulate to you is that when you look at large numbers of IOs, when you look at all IOs, you will see that the, the IOs are teeming with insight about what is happening up in compute. But you have to look at large sets of them over space and over time. 
And let me share with you some ways that we do that to optimize performance. So getting back to what you zeroed right in on about the D-stage process. When the allocator thread is pulling data sections out of memory and is getting ready to lay them down into stripes, which will go down to disk, it is not choosing them randomly. It is not a linear mapping between addresses that are visible to users and layout on disk like traditional RAID. It's not a static mapping like some of the first generation distributed RAID systems from HP and IBM. It's smarter. <laughs> what we do in cache <coughs> is we classify every data section and we add metadata that we use for intelligent data placement. The first thing is the checksum that we mentioned for data protection. The second is a timestamp from a synchronized high precision clock which um, is going to come into play when we talk about snapshots in about five minutes. During the D-stage process, the first thing that we do is very simply, we also measure what we call the temperature of each section. And temperature is exactly what you think it is. It's how hot or cold is it. And we never mix hot and cold data together in stripes. We try to keep data that's at roughly the same temperature together for uh, assembly into stripes. And the reason we do this is in this architecture, it's a log structured write. So if you overwrite a address that's visible to users, if you update a file in our file system or if you overwrite a block, we're gonna write that to a new location but we now have a housekeeping task. We have to eventually, we want to reclaim, as long as there's no snapshots pointing to it, if the reference count is zero, we want to pull that stripe up, free up that data, mix it with something else to get that, uh, that capacity back. These are housekeeping IOPS. They don't benefit users, so we want to keep them to a minimum. The trivial measurement of just checking and keeping track of the temperature of each data section as a metadata and storing it in metadata com uh, as close to completely eliminates those housekeeping IOs as possible. But there's a lot more to it. <clears throat> oh, anyway, so just in case it's not obvious, the end result of all of this is that we are packing data sections together on disk that have similar activity patterns. And we call this a mul multimodal write. Um, by, by similar patterns, you don't mean you're packing the hottest ones all together, do you? Yes. Well, the, uh, hot ones go together, medium and cold ones to go together. However, and if then, a data and then they is, get promoted to cache together. Yes. Okay. Yes, they're gonna they're, they're gonna go together. Um, so the end result of all of this, of what we're trying to do is we are trying to take all the insight we can get from the, our computations on incoming IOs to build locality of reference into the data as we're laying it down to disk to optimize for prefetch. In a hybrid architecture even like this. Even though they may be different LUNs. Oh, they're they guaranteed to be different. To be, they're yeah. not guaranteed. It, they're almost certainly different LUNs in modern just because they happen to have the same, I'll call it access frequency, you're going to you're going to populate a single stripe with that data at that access frequency level. Because and the temperature is not enough. And on the next slide, I'm going to talk about our other two classes of algorithms. Temperature is ju is just one, and that's just to minimize for uh, overwrites and having housekeep housekeeping IAMs. What we're trying to do here is we're trying to build locality of reference into the data at its laid down because disk IOPS are the most expensive thing in our system. Each drive can only do about 100 IOPS. You wanna do big megabyte size IOs to maximize aggregate bandwidth. And when you do choose to do an IOP, you wanna get the most valuable data, let's say for a prefetching operation, and the least amount of useless adjacent data. And so all we're, what we're doing here is setting ourselves up for success with that. And that brings us to the cache manager, which along with the try is 
a central cluster of patents that we have that makes the level of performance that we get possible with, um, with our architecture. <clears throat> so as we discussed in the, early in the presentation, the role of the DRAM and the NAND flash in our architecture is to be a tra transparent cache sitting in front of the drives. Now we use a four kilobyte slot size for managing our cache. So if you multiply that into the amount of DRAM and SSD, it means we have around 12 billion slots in cache for storing the working set. Or another way to think about it is at any point in time, we can make 12 billion bets about what we think a future I.O. is going to be. And to prefetch that and get that into memory so that it's fast and instead of taking you know, milliseconds, we can do it in, um, in microseconds. We can take, make 12 billion bets at a time. <clears throat> the other thing to be aware of is in our design, we intentionally make the cache blind to high-level data structures like LUNs and the file system and host objects. All the cache is aware of is data sections, those 64 kilobyte objects, and the metadata that we tag them with. And all of the decisions that we have to make about preemptively pulling data and putting it into one of those 12 billion slots, making a bet, a prediction about future IOs, we do it only with the metadata. <clears throat> so here's how the process works. So why is your slot size four kilobytes, but your section size is 64? Why wouldn't the slot size be equivalent to a section size? So the more granular, that's a great question. The more granular the cache is, the more, um, the higher that cache hit ratio you're going to have, because not every application does 64 kilobyte um, IOs. But you're going to bring in a whole 64 kilobyte stripe effectively when you read something into cache. That's right. You may free up portions of it because they're not being ac accessed or something like that? That's correct. That's correct. And there's also a bitmap which has within the section a, uh, yeah. a, another level of um, granularity, I guess, which is how we do the, the 16x reduction. Okay. So here's... I would, I, I would posit that as you expand into general purpose <laughs> file access, <clears throat> I'd like you to be more metadata, you know, your file system metadata is going to want to, much of it's going to want to be in cache. And, and, probably and, gets to stay and in cache being, you're being smarter about in. that mm -hmm. might be a good idea. <clears throat> I, I think being smart, this smart, and I'm not being cheeky with you, the more intelligent you can make your system, it's another way of solving the problem. Option A is to throw money at a problem, to use media. Binding which, data into cache. Yeah. Option two is to use intelligence, to use computation, to have small amounts of cache appear, appear larger than they are. And CPU is so cheap today compared to, um, compared to storage. But anyway, so the way that this process works is bef when a IO hits our cache, before we do anything to service it, the first thing that we do is we say, what does this I.O., how does it add to our corpus of knowledge of what's happening up in compute? And the way we do that is by organizing I.O.s into what we call activity vectors. So an activity vector, I actually made a picture here. <clears throat> an activity vector is an ordered set of I.O.s which spans pending IOs that where we received the request but we haven't returned the data yet. It includes a rolling history that goes back into the past. And critically, it points into the future and it makes predictions about where this is going. And think of activity vectors as, an, as a counterpart to compute threads. A compute thread is a series of CPU instructions that have a, a, a they're, they're part of a, of a, of a series of a, of a computation and we call, them, we call them threads. So our concept of an AV 
is the storage I.O. equivalent to that. Well, except that <clears throat> I, as the developer, organize my code into threads. And, and we have to do it heuristically, yes. Yeah. Yes. You know, <clears throat> you're, you're getting a big pile of cotton and having to weave a suit out of it. Yeah. Yes, we are. <laughs> but again, if you make it simple enough, make the questions that you're asking simple enough, and make it multi-threaded so you can run it on a large number of CPU cores, with a modest amount of computation, you can gain tremendous insight. Every I.O. that comes in is, is analyzed by, we, by a component that we call the sequence detector. The sequence detector attempts to classify every I.O. into one of the activity vectors which it's tracking. That ID, which is fuzzy, it's a heuristic, it's not programmed, it's completely algorithmic, is recorded in the metadata section as a fingerprint or a sequence ID, which is our guess of how we think this I.O. correlates with other I.O.s into assembled into an activity vector. And if you only look at pending I.O.s, the signals are relatively weak. However, as you add and you look into the rolling history, the signal gets stronger. <clears throat> The, um, are, are you tracking things like the last time, the last f of the last 400 times this block was accessed, these other blocks were accessed yes. with it? Yes. Yes. I mean, I, I, its implementation details the size of the the, the buffers, but in, in principle, it's exactly what it is. All right, I got you. So why I like this, it. Why is this? Why is the activity vector of the last time a block was actually in cache? And relevant to what's happening at this point in time when we're trying to bring the blocking case. It's not specifically when it was last, it was the correlation. So imagine this, imagine the last, the I.O. at the tip of the, of the vector. So it is literally the last I.O. that came into the system for, uh, for a read. Starting from that point, we now have a graph of all potential data sections which could be accessed next as part of this read. And because of the depth of our uh, buffer, which is basically the number of concurrent fingerprint IDs, within a couple of IOs, that graph includes all two billion or whatever data sections. And so we don't, we don't have nearly enough cache. So we have to make predictions. So it's not the time or when some future piece of data was in cache, but it's the correlation of how statistically correlated is a particular data section, a potential candidate to be prefetched with the pending and the history going backward. And by looking into the history, it increases the strength of the signal and it allows us to make a statistical calculation very quickly of what sections have elevated probability of being accessed in the near future. The ones with the highest level go into DRAM. The ones with slightly lower go into NAND flash. The ones that don't are ignored. So if I've got an Oracle index, when somebody does a query against that table, it's always going to hit the top of the tree in that index. Okay. And then it, it's a B tree, and so mm -hmm. the next the next IOs are always one of these several at the next level down, and you know that. So when I when the query hits, you're prefetching the rest of the, the index. Yes and no. So we don't know it. You don't know. You don't know it's an index, but you know that we derive it. You because know that, that the IO that follows reading this LBA is always one of these four next LBAs. If there is correlation or locality of reference in either the space or time domain, right. our heuristics are tuned to detect that. Is it just space and time, or is it space, time, and source, and requester? Um, that's a good question. The two classes that I'm aware of are the space and time sections. Right, because uh, if you kept requester, then you could demultiplex it out and get even smarter. We used to, we used yeah, to I'll, have to, I'll have to look into that, but I, I don't believe that the, 
the initiator address plays any um, plays any part of it. But I, 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 I'd have to check. Divide the world in cache to be random sec random data and sequential data. And random data wouldn't do any prefetch, but sequential data we try to determine if it was sequential. It's a false dichotomy. It's a false dichotomy. Right, but sequential but data is dichotomy. it is well, sequential there's, data there's, is highly correlated. Semi sequential. The, or excuse me, oh, semi sequential. It's okay. It falls in sequential. No, no, no the, the excuse me. There's the semi random. There's the that if you have a, a literally an index in a database, it's right. you walk the tree, and if that tree's been walked two hundred times, that's temporal locality of reference. Then that, you have then you have temporal yes. locality of reference, and you know when the guy starts walking this tree, fetch the rest of the tree, even yes. if it's not stored sequentially. Mm -hmm. the, the, the problem was if it was sequential. And you started prefetching lots of data. You effectively flooded your cache with all those data, which may or may not be referenced. Right. So you started effectively deallocating the data behind the the, the pointer mm -hmm. in the sequence. Right. So, in, so, so instead yeah. of instead of saying he accessed LBA seventeen, so let me fetch twenty nineteen through twenty eight. Yeah, yeah. He's saying I'm saying he's, I'm saying I hit the the top of the tree in the index. Which he notices because he knows the LBA that it, that that is, and he's got history that says that the next I/O that comes after you hit the top of the tree is one of the nodes below it. So he prefetches those, even though they're not stored sequentially, they're logically connected, and he's impugning that logical connections from the order in which the I/Os occur. They're going to end up in the same activity vector if it's working correctly. So, quick quick point of order: we've got about twenty cool. minutes left. Okay. So I know right. there's still <laughs> stuff to get through. So. I we could talk about the, yeah, this, this particular topic, topic um, but yeah. I I do have a couple of other things I want to share with you okay. in in our time. So I'm gonna, okay. but I'm happy to spend as much time off camera. I'm, yeah. Get into this, you got but just turning. It's always what turning. I want to leave you with is, even though the algorithms are actually very interesting for this, the principle is very very simple, and the amount of computation relatively is, the CPU budget is relatively small for this. This is what allows us to use a tiny amount of DRAM and NAND flash, and have it perform like or better than much more expensive media uh, systems, all flash-based systems, um, and not take the cost penalty and also the more annoying um, troubleshooting that comes from those systems. This is all there is. The next thing that I'd like to share with you is some, no some information about our snapshot implementation. And um, this is one of the lies that I would like to um, to, 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 uh, <laughs> to put out there. I, we hear this all the time. Snapshots aren't interesting. They're table stakes. They're at RFP checkpoint checkbox. Do you have them or you don't? Um, Allow me to say horse hockey. <laughs> <laughs> so if you then talk to the technical salesperson, they will give you a little more information. They'll say there's good snapshots and bad snapshots. Bad snapshots are copy on write. Good snapshots are redirect on write. Um, what I am postulating is that they're both bad, or maybe that's being too, ne too negative. There is room for improvement in both of these. And the reason you know that is true is every modern file system and storage system that I'm aware of, and the U.S. Patent Office is aware of, <laughs> has strange behavior that happens when you add large numbers of snapshots or um, a large, velo large velocity of creation of them. This is why one of the fundamental reasons why you see data sheets for storage products that go up to multi-petabytes, but you can only, you know, you try to go before, above a fraction of that and then they, they tell you you need to buy another system. What it all comes down to is lock management in the cache. In order to take a snapshot, you have to lock certain data structures in memory during the duration of the snap being taken. And if you don't, you can have an I.O. that's half in and half out of the snap. And it's, it's data corruption. So one of the kind of dirty secrets in our industries that storage developers all know and take for granted, but customer technologists, uh, I find, don't really grok this that modern storage systems, or all storage systems, spend a non-trivial amount of time being locked, where they're not servicing I.O., where they're buffering I.O.s in their, in their drivers, while management operations 
are occurring. And this is all for data consistency. It is a huge pain in the butt, this type of programming, under the best of circumstances. When you bring scale out technologies and um, uh, distributed lock management, it is a nightmare. So we developed a system that completely bypasses all of this. And let me, uh, yeah, so we'll start here. Okay. You remember that we can have in our VUA, we can have multiple addresses that point to the same piece of data. So for us, creating a snapshot is a pure metadata operation. It's the creation of pointers. It's inserting them into the try. It is a zero time operation. There's no copying of data or anything like that. I, you, you just said that writing the data into the try takes zero time. It's a zero time operation, so it's it's fixed and it's it's. It's a fixed point in time. It's yes. an O one time. It it's, takes a, it, you know, it doesn't doesn't necessarily it increase doesn't, or exactly. exponentially based on number of elements in the tree or try. Yes, that I'll buy. Yeah, zero and, is a special number. Yeah. yeah, and this has profound implications not just for the performance of the snapshots, but also the way that you design. Your, uh, your APIs, um, everybody says they have a REST API. Most of them are terrible. You ex execute a command, and then you have to keep calling back to see if it completed yet. It's gross. This allows us, when I say zero time, you want to create a snapshot, even if it's a petabyte, the, it's the entire system, or, or, or whatever the capacity is. You take it, it completes, it's fixed, it's whatever it is, a fraction of a millisecond, and it's in. <clears throat> now, critically, we do this without any locking of our metadata whatsoever when we take a snapshot. So how do we take a snap without, how do we guarantee integrity of snap groups without having a locking mechanism? <clears throat> In that 4K metadata page that's associated with every data section, we include a timestamp. So we have timestamps for every write that has come into the system. Or more precisely, for every 64 kilobytes worth of written data. Because of this, a write is unambiguously in or out of a snap based on the timestamp of when the snap was created and the timestamp of all the pending IOs. It's either in or out, whether it occurred before or after. This allows us to have write integrity or data integrity across our snapshots without any locking of metadata whatsoever. So you keep the timestamp for a snap as well as, a, as for the write? Yes. Yes. The snapshot object itself also has a timestamp. So what this means for customers is we support 100,000 snaps <coughs> per system with no performance penalty whatsoever. And by the way, we just made that number up. We asked customers what was the most number of snaps they needed. We took the heart, the biggest one, and we doubled it. But if you're a customer and you need 200,000 snaps, call us. We'll test it. And if, you, if it's OK, which it will be, we will increase the limit on your system. Is that per object or per system? Per system. Number two, a volume with and without snapshots has indistinguishable performance. I can take. A, um, a volume that's naked and is not mirrored and not with no local replication, no remote replication, and I can have one that has many, many replicas and copies, and they will have indistinguishable performance. Finally, and I got a question during the last uh, briefing round at VMworld, how many snaps per second can your system, so I actually tested this over a VPN I was able to issue 25 snaps per second pretty consistently to a snap group, which, by the way, try that on any existing system, and, and, and it's, it's not going to work. And that's a per group limit, or per group that was, performance? I'm not sure where the bottleneck is. I assume it's in the API server. I mean, that's a lot of, <laughs> that's a very okay. busy, you know. <laughs> Um, but not only that, not only does the server accept it, the storage system accept them and execute them, during that time, the latency will be razor flat. I challenge you, try this on any file system or any storage system that is commercially available today. Try to create a velocity of this many snaps, and you will see extremely, if it's even able to, to keep up, you will see extremely jagged uh, latency curves. 
which is all about the locking and unlocking mechanisms. It's all about metadata. So is the metadata sharded across the three servers or replicated across the three servers? Uh, neither. Could, it's stored in the drives down Could you just below. mention the async uh, implications or how we use yeah, this phrasing? Yeah, sure. So just to answer your question, it's neither. Because remember how there's no cache coherency? Each VU is strictly managing its own address space. And a volume is a stripe across all of the um, components. So all, the only thing that needs to be synchronized is just start and stop times. There has to be consensus that a snap is beginning and ending, which we do with timestamps. But that's the only consistency. There's no metadata central to the way that we scale out our cache by increasing the number of VUs is they have to be autonomous. They can't communicate with each other or else you're going to hit a limit very quickly um, of how big you can go. Now, a classic example beyond business continuity where this starts to change customers' lives is we tell them, snap everything. Even if you don't have an SLA for an application for snapshots, snap it once an hour or once a day. Um, and then if something goes wrong, software upgrade, whatever, you can always roll back. This changes customers' lives from a risk management perspective. When you have true zero penalty snaps we don't charge for the feature. They're space efficient, 64 kilobyte granularity. They're also what we build our replication engine on top of. The way our replication works is very simple. When you mirror a volume, you take, we take a snapshot every n number of seconds. We ship that log. We apply it to the slave. And then once there's consensus that it applied, we click, click forward and we delete the previous snapshot. Um, as a result, you can have a system with 100,000 whatever replicated volumes or one big one literally replicating the entire array, and we can guarantee a four-second recovery point objective. Um, and again, on any system that's based on locking and unlocking of metadata, which is every other storage system. Okay, run this by me again. <laughs> so you're doing point-in-time replication based on the snapshot mechanism. Mm -hmm and a four second RPO. Four second RPO, yes. Assuming infinite bandwidth. Assuming right. sufficient bandwidth, yes. Okay. Yeah, I always forget to mention that. Yes, mm -hmm. you have to have a big mm -hmm. enough pipe. Yeah, no, no, this, this is one of my pet peeves with, with people who do point in time replication where they claim that the granularity is the RPO and they forget the fact that it takes time to transfer the snapshot. Yes. We like to not deny the existence yes. of network people and network things. <laughs> <laughs> it's just yeah, easier that way. I was one for 20 years. I right. haven't quite given so, it up yet. So, guys, I, I, unfortunately, we're, we're running out of time and I want to have time for questions and I know so you have So it's Howard shut up time, no problem. No, 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 this is, <laughs> this is all good. But I'm here, I mean, I'm not going anywhere and I, I'm happy to go into any more detail. I also have colleagues, I have developers in a Google Hangout. Yep. If you want to go into more detail, I would like to just at a very high level talk about our file system <coughs> after quite a long beta is finally, um, we announced it at VMworld and we're going to be um, enabling it in, in a couple of weeks for production usage for all of our customers. Central to our philosophy is that we have to move as an industry away from best of breed solutions. This is the best NAS, this is the best storage for databases, this is the best storage for archive. And we have to start creating horizontal platforms for information storage in order to claim back our sanity in data centers and not have operations complexity. So central to our design is that above our cache, we can have protocol drivers for Block, for iSCSI and Fiber Channel, for FICON and mainframe emulation, and for Object and for NAS protocols, and have them be first level peers to each other. So the first non-Block protocol that we are supporting is NFS. This is a non-disruptive, it's a free software update that we're pushing out in two weeks to all customers. And I would like to just briefly summarize how the architecture works. So as I said, the hardware abstraction and our, the core, the emulation layer, the tri, <coughs> VUA, the VDA is common to all. <coughs> On top of this, we have a SCSI port driver, which services Fiber Channel and iSCSI. And by the way, things that are in uh, 
uh, dashed our uh, works in progress. I included iSCSI in there because we support it with virtual machine clusters. It's a little trick we do to speed up the QA process. We're going to be bringing it natively onto the box um, next year. So I want to talk about what's in, um, in orange here, which is our NFS implementation. Like all of our other protocols, the NFS server runs in user space. There is no kernel code whatsoever for the NFS server. And the file system itself is very innovative and modern. <clears throat> we use a B tree for storing the catalog. So I know you had other NAS vendors that are in here today that use B trees. If you're familiar with HFS Plus from Apple, <laughs> HFS Plus is a pretty solid is a pretty solid file system from an, from a developer's perspective. We th we think it's elegant. Or uh, ButterFS, um, Ohad Rade is uh, who kind of conceptualized ButterFS is a is a really smart dude from IBM Research, um, and. Ahad, if you want to come work for us, consider it an open invitation. <laughs> um, wow. So we store the catalog in a B tree. And then we store the user data in uh, data sections, like everything that I just described previously. For block, it's the same. The difference is you can conceptualize. Rather than a linear space, it is a B tree, which we create a POSIX hierarchy out of. And that's how we shard it out to the VUs. But everything else is the same. Uh, and, and you're not intermixing the metadata and the data as directly. They're not intermixed. They're separate. But we right. store the metadata for persistence in data sections. Just the inodes, a particular section might have user data on it or it might have inodes on it. Right. Um, and we treat them exactly the same. What we do <clears throat> differently from traditional B tree type file systems is we have no log writing mechanism. So we interface directly with the cache. We do not use SCSI. <clears throat> we actually use Google protocol buffers for all of our components to talk to each other, including the um, file system talking to the, um, um, to the cache. And we call them emule writes. I didn't make it up. It sounds better in Hebrew than it does in English. <laughs> One of the few things that does, by the way. An emulated write <laughs> allows us to kind of get around a lot of the transaction consistency issues and a lot of the complexity that comes from file systems that have to do with journaling and logging. This mechanism allows us to do what we call section functions. So this is an operation where if we need to do multiple transactions and they need to be cons uh, happen atomically, the, uh, the file system can issue a section transaction to the cache, which will run a set of things ato um, atomically. It is perfectly analogous to a stored procedure in a database. Do all of these things, but you have to, do, you have to complete the entire function. You can't go halfway. <clears throat> So by just eliminating SCSI and the journaling and the log mechanism. So you, you pushed atomicity down into the yes, volume into, manager. From, from there into the, the file system. Yes. It makes it the level of complexity <coughs> that it reduces in the code and the corner cases and everything is staggering. The file system, I don't know how many lines of code it is, but it is not a lot. It is a very tight and very simple implementation. Number two, we have a unified cache. One of the problems with all the old school, big three letter, four letter companies is they, um, they build block devices and they build a file system on top of it. You have a file system cache and a block cache that don't communicate with each other and duplicate. There is one cache, which is our cache manager, activity vectors, the whole thing. So there is no cache whatsoever in the file system. It is only buffers in the NFS server and everything. Radically improves performance. Could you use the same logic to support T10 atomic writes? <clears throat> um, yeah, if, if, if we wanted to. I mean, our mechanism with checksums is kind of covers the bases. But if we wanted to extend that up to the, up to the host, we absolutely could with, with, with T10. 
Um, this is a good stopping point. I, I will end with kind of two things. First, a picture of the system. Um, this is our best, our best guess of what we think in order to handle these ridiculously futuristic workloads that are coming that I talked about a little bit in the beginning. This is our best effort of creating a platform that can get there. So getting back to my original question of why build high-end, huge disk storage systems today? Um, because the, the types of workloads that are, uh, are evolving require them. This is the most credible plan that we think exists for, for, for making these. Um, and we're not done, we're just getting started. Um, and I would just like to finish by thanking, um, there were a lot of people who helped get this content together, but specifically I would like to thank Eldar, Leo, Aviad, Iran, Jacob, and Greg. Um, you guys are awesome, and uh, thank you for helping us get all this content together. So that's it, we'll call it a wrap. <laughs>